in your memory even now. So we're going to learn a memory verse now and its relevance will become clear later on. Uh, so this is a verse from Isaiah chapter 53 and it's verse 6. So if can, we can all please say together, if you can see it on the screen then please join in. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So it's a very familiar verse. You may already know it off by heart, in which case, 10 out of 10. Um, we'll say it one more time together with the words on the screen, and then we'll have a go uh, reciting it without the words on the screen. Okay, so all together from the top. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Okay, we'll lose the words on the screen. From the top, we all. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one to our own way, and he has laid on the iniquity of us all. No, I didn't remember them all either. <laughs> anyway, all will become clear later um, because I have um, someone else to introduce to you, and that's a gentleman sitting over there. Peter, come and join me on the uh, platform. This is my youngest son, Peter. Um, he's enormously tall. For many, many years, um, Although he's my youngest son, I've been looking up to him. Um, so he's here to preach to us today. Uh, I've no idea what he's going to say, um, but I'm looking forward to it immensely. So Peter, tell the nice people where you're from. Uh, currently living down in Bournemouth, down by the sea. Nice, very nice. Good, good, good. And how are things in your little fellowship at the moment? Yeah, things are going really well. We've been really blessed because we're quite a small congregation um, we have been able to meet for quite a long time um, we are, we're, we're blessed to have a building that are still happy to have us because we don't own our own building um, we're, we're renting somewhere else they're still happy to have us every every Sunday and uh, yeah things are going really well at the moment so praise God Excellent. Um, is there anything significant that we can uh pray to the Lord for you, anything happening in your life at the minute, um, anything at home, um, so that we can uh, pray intelligently for you after we've heard your message and gone home. There are two things that immediately spring to mind. Um, first, you'll notice that the, the beautiful woman who was sat next to me, um, that's not my mum. Um, oh. Sorry. She is beautiful, but that's not the woman I was talking about. Um, is my wife. 
Um, her name is Lydia, and we are very happy to say that she is pregnant. Um, so, yes, do be praying for us both as we prepare to be parents, as we put up with all of the pregnancy woes and things, um, and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, please pray for us uh, with that in mind. Um, the other thing, uh, we found out yesterday that the flat we were supposed to be moving into on Tuesday 31st, so not this Tuesday coming, the Tuesday after, um, can no longer have us, but we need to be out of our flat. So we might be a little bit homeless for a little bit. Um, we have a plan, we are putting all our stuff in storage and moving in with Lydia's parents, which is a huge blessing to us. They've been very generous with us. Um, but do please pray that we manage to find a place of our own that we can move into uh, as soon as possible, <laughs> ideally, please. <laughs> okay, that's great, thank you. Before we go, we'll just uh, pray. Uh, Lord God, thank you for Peter and for Lydia. Uh, we just lift them to you and their situations. Thank you for this opportunity to hear from your word through Peter. We pray that as we listen, you will speak to our hearts. Thank you for the time that you have been with Peter in his study and in his preparation. We know that you have great things in store, both for him in the future and for us today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Okay, we're going to sing again, and it's a song that speaks to our heart a little bit about that iniquity and guilt we read about in our memory verse just now, and about the one who paid the ultimate price to take that guilt away. My Lord. Love is this that pays so dearly that I, the guilty one, may go free.
It's right to celebrate our salvation through Jesus, but we should not forget that we're living in a fallen, broken and hurting world. And the one place that's on everybody's lips at the moment is Afghanistan. And uh, so let's pray. Lord, we believe that you hear us when we pray to you. And right now we stand on that promise in your word that where one or two meet in your name, you are there in the midst. We, along with many other Christians across the world, pray for Afghanistan. Lord God, we pray for its people, those ordinary folk who are caught up in the chaos at Kabul airport as thousands try to flee the country after the Taliban takeover. Few of them have faith in you, Lord God, as we do, but even so, we do pray for their safety. They are part of your creation, after all, and we know that you see the suffering and despair on their faces. We pray for our political and military leaders as they look for ways to help the helpless and work towards a peaceful transition of power. We pray too for our Christian MPs that they will hear your voice clearly and that their voices in turn would be clearly heard in the corridors of power. We remember, Lord Jesus, as you walked this earth, that you showed us what real compassion looks like. Help us as a nation and as individuals to show that same love and compassion to those in such great need, both overseas and on our doorsteps. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We're going to sing one more song before Peter comes to speak to us, and uh, it's You Chose the Cross with Every Breath, the Perfect Life, the Perfect Death. And you might see a theme in the choice of songs, that they're all pointing to Jesus, the sacrifice that he made for you and for me.
good morning. Do excuse me while I set up my table. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. It's been a while since I have stood behind a pulpit to preach. In fact, the last time I think I actually preached was when I preached here last time, which was something like two years ago. So do with that information what you will. Um, I, fair warning, the church that I attend regularly has uh, sermons that go on for a minimum of 45 minutes. Now, I'll do my best to keep things to a short, sharp half an hour, Um, but if things start going on for for too long, uh, feel free to wave frantically at me and I will ignore you. Um, Anyway, the text that I'm going to preach from this morning uh, comes from the book of Romans, uh, Romans 3, verses 21 to 31. Um, So if you have Bibles, feel free to to turn to it. We will be living in it for the next half an hour or so. Um, So I'll give you a moment to grab it if you would like. Right, so Romans 3, verses 21 to 31. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to has been made known to which the law and prophets testify this righteousness from god comes through faith in jesus christ to all who believe there is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by christ jesus god presented it God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies who have, those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Now, John Stott uh, says of Romans 3, 21 to 26, that first part, that it is possibly the most important single paragraph ever written. It's so crucial to our understanding of the gospel. And for that reason, I'm going to pray for us as we begin. Father God, we thank you and we praise you for your word, that you have preserved it for us, that in it is everything that we need to know about you. You have revealed to us your very nature through your word. And we ask that this morning, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would reveal to us the risen Christ through this text. That as we spend time in it, that as we chew on it, that we would come to know you in a new and fresh way, and that you would instruct us on the way that we should live as a result. Amen. So this passage splits up quite nicely and neatly into two slightly different focuses. Verses 21 to 26 and then 27 to 31. So we'll have a look at both of those in turn. Now there is 
a lot going on in this, these two paragraphs. Um, so forgive me if I don't go into all of it. There is a, a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that's going on there. Um, if I went into all of it, we'd be here until sometime next week, probably. So it's probably best that I don't. So we'll start with a bit of context for the book of Romans. Context is always helpful with uh, understanding bits of scripture. Coming at a piece of scripture without context is like watching a series in the middle of the series without ever having watched anything. It might be quite funny and quite good at the time, but you don't really understand the full story, the full context of what's going on without, having, without knowing what comes beforehand. So we'll have a bit of a look. Paul, who writes the vast majority of the New Testament, uh, writes letters to churches that he's planted uh, or visited. Um, who knows? Or, Paul goes on two missionary journeys, right? On which of those journeys did Paul go to Rome? I'm seeing some shaken heads because he didn't go to Rome. Paul never went to Rome until the end of his life. He always wanted to go to Rome to meet the Roman Christians, but he didn't get the chance until he went to Rome and was arrested and eventually killed for his faith in Christ. So why has he written this, this letter to the, to the church in Rome? He hears that there is a church that started that he hasn't been able to get to yet. He doesn't know how much of the gospel they've heard. So he writes them this letter. He writes the book of Romans, and the book of Romans is Paul's magnum opus of the gospel. If you want to get an idea of, of the gospel from beginning to end, the book of Romans gives it to you like that. Previously in Paul's letter leading up to our passage this morning, Paul has been laying out the problem, right? It's as though humanity has been taken to court for all of our offences against God, and I can tell you there are quite a few. Romans 1 through to uh, chapter 3, verse 20, has been all of the evidence against us, and it comes to a climax in verses 9 to 20. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God, and all have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Well, that, that's it, isn't it? We have no defence. Nothing can save us now. We are guilty as charged. We are totally deserving of the wrath of God. It's a good way to start a sermon, isn't it? But Paul then changes his tie. He's no longer the lawyer for the prosecution. He puts on his criminal defence lawyer tie and utters possibly the most relieving, most important, Incredible, most gospel infused, mind blowing, heart melting, and unbelievable two words. But now. But now. These two words on their own almost capture the whole scandalous, undeserved, outrageous nature of the gospel. He has just presented us with our position the posi a position of our own making that destined us for hell and destruction. Our cosmic rebellion, our repeated treason against the eternal, holy, perfect, just, loving creator God, it renders us spiritually dead, adrift in the foul river of our sin that flows in one direction, 
away from God, who is the source of all that is good. He is the source of life. But now. That but now has three layers to it. Logical, firstly. It's a but now in the sense of this is where Paul's argument is going. He's changing tack slightly. It's a but now in a chronological sense, in the sense of time. That was then. This is now. And finally, it's a but now in an eschatological sense. That's a big word for this time on a Sunday. You can tell me that. It's a but now in the sense that the final destination of our soul has changed. Are we getting that this morning? We used to be destined for hell and destruction, forever in the presence of the wrath of God. But now we're not. The river of sin that takes us away from God, right? God reached down in the person of Jesus Christ and plucked us out of the river, and now our paths have changed forever, eternally. Now, we've but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So it's apart from the law, but the law and the prophets testify to it. Now this, I think, can cause a little bit of confusion. When I was looking into it myself, it did seem a little bit like the equation was skewed, but there is a way of balancing the equation if we understand it properly. So how can this be both apart from the law and yet be testified by the law and the prophets? When Paul says that this righteousness is apart from the law, he's talking about the fact that it has nothing to do with a legal adherence to the law. There has been a complete change, a new era, if you will. But the law and the prophets talk about it. The whole of the Old Testament gives glimpses of the gospel. It's all there if we look for it. If all we had was the Old Testament, we would have the gospel if we knew where to look for it. Right from the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned and realised they were naked, God killed an animal to make them clothes from its skin. Their sin was covered, but something had to die. Already, God is saying, for sin to be dealt with, there has to be death. We're beginning to see a picture. Then we fast forward to the Levitical sacrifice laws. God says, look, sin is serious. Sin is an offence against me. And if you want to deal with it and be in a relationship with me, something needs to be sacrificed, something needs to die. But there was something not quite complete about this, this plan. You had to keep doing it year on year. Year on year, you would have to go to the temple and offer your sacrifice of atonement. It wasn't a once and for all solution. Abraham and Isaac, we remember the story, yes? Isaac, the son, promised to Abraham, his only son. We all remember how Abraham was told by God to sacrifice his only son. When the day came, Isaac carried the wood for the sacrifice on his back up a hill in the region of Moriah. Are we beginning to see a picture? All the way up the hill, Isaac asks his father, where is the lamb to be sacrificed? Abraham's response, the Lord will provide. When God stopped Abraham from killing his son, he provided a, a ram for the sacrifice. Are we beginning to see the picture? A precious, promised son carrying the wood for a sacrifice up a hill in the region of Moriah. Notice that Abraham said that God would provide a lamb. But for this sacrifice, he provided a ram. Was Abraham wrong? 
No, because God would provide a lamb, but he hasn't come yet. Fast forward with me again and you find prophets like Isaiah. As we remember earlier, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid our iniquity on him. Talking about the one who is yet to come. The iniquity of us all. Christ's death and resurrection are a fulfilment of the whole of the Old Testament. It's not a divine afterthought, it's plan A. So apart from the law, but as the law and prophets testify to, the righteousness of God has been made known. Now notice the past tense. The righteousness of God isn't being made known, it's not about to be made known, it's not going to be made known in the future. This has already happened. A seismic shift in salvation history has already taken place in the death and resurrection of Jesus. There is nothing more that needs to happen. There is nothing more that we have to do. There's nothing more that we can do to ensure our salvation. God in Jesus has already done it. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Now Paul talks about God's righteousness four times in our passage this morning, in verses 21, 22, 25, and 26. We hear quite a lot of people talking about the righteousness of God. So I think it's really important that we understand what that actually means. It often gets snuck in as a bit of Christianese, doesn't it? So it's important that we get a a real grip of what righteousness is. Some people say, some theologians say that it's a characteristic of God. It's part of who he is. It's part of his nature. Others say that it's God's saving initiative of Christ's death and resurrection. Some say that it's a status, one that God requires of us if we're to stand before him, a status that is achieved in the atoning sacrifice of Christ. Now there are others, myself included, that say, why choose? Why not all three? God's righteousness is a divine attribute, it's part of his character, a divine activity, part of his his saving initiative at the cross, and a divine achievement, one at the cross and resurrection. This righteousness is given to all who believe through faith in Jesus. Now Paul, later on in his defence of the gospel of grace by faith, he talks a little bit more about the whole thing of faith or works. Which is it? Is it faith? Is it works? Now, I think it can be very easy to fall into a trap of thinking that we have, in in some small way, earned our redemption by faith. We think that faith gives us some kind of merit. Our faith is a tick in our box. We deserve salvation because we have faith. And the problem is, by doing that, we're substituting one merit for another. We're substituting works for faith, and it doesn't quite work like that. Now, John Stott puts this really helpfully. It is vital to affirm that there is nothing meritorious about faith. And when we say that salvation is by faith, not works, we are not substituting one kind of merit, faith, for another, works. The value of our faith is not to be found in itself, but entirely and exclusively its object, namely Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let me explain this so that we we totally get it, right? Because he's using quite a lot of big language. If I sit in this chair, I have faith 
that I'm not going to fall on the floor into a crumpled heap of me. Now, is it my faith that stops me from falling on the floor into a hump, crumpled heap of me? No, it's the chair. It's not my faith. In the same way, it's not our faith in Jesus that saves us. It is, and can only ever be, Jesus' atoning work on the cross. We simply receive that salvation through faith. But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Christ Jesus. Justified. I think we should spend a little bit of time just breathing in and exploring this idea of justification. Another big word for us to chew on this morning. Paul uses this term in verses 24 and 26 and another 20 times found mostly in Romans uh, chapters 2 through to 5 and Galatians uh, 2 and 3. And there is a really important distinction to be made. One that I know that I have to remind myself of on a regular basis. Justification is not forgiveness. I'll say that again. Justification isn't forgiveness. Justification is a legal term. It's a term that would have been used in in courts at the time. That means a bestowal of righteousness. A reinstatement if you will. Forgiveness implies a negative action, uh, the suspension of penalty or debt. Justification, on the other hand, implies a positive action, the sinner's reinstatement in the favour and fellowship of God. Forgiveness says you're free to go. You've been let off the hook. You've been let off your punishment that your sins deserve. Justification says you're free to come. You are welcome to all of my love and my presence. You are welcomed into the inner courts of the King, the God Most High, because you are bestowed with the righteousness of God as one at the cross of Christ. Soak that in for a moment. Not only are we let off the punishment that we deserve, not only are we granted mercy, not getting what we do deserve, but we are given grace. We get what we don't deserve. We're justified. We are welcomed into the family of God. We are adopted as sons and daughters of God Most High. Now, it's important to point out that this idea of justification is also not sanctification. Lots of big words this morning. Sanctification is the ongoing process that goes on in the life of a believer by which his Holy Spirit shapes and moulds us into the likeness of Christ. When we're justified, we're given a new nature. We're given a new label, if you like. We no longer have a big old tag that says sinner on us. We get given robes of righteousness. We're righteous, not sinners, because of Christ. But that doesn't make us the finished article. I'm sure that doesn't come as a surprise to most of us. Grief. I look at myself sometimes and think, you couldn't be further from the finished article. When we're justified, we are welcomed into the citizenship of the kingdom of God. But we still need to learn to live as citizens of this new kingdom. But it's still an amazing and incredibly humbling truth that God would welcome us into his family despite being the very reason that the Son of God died. It was while we were still sinners that God sent his Son to be sin for us that we might be the righteousness of God. 
Now, there's a lot more that could be said about verses 21 through to 26, but I'm looking at the time and I've taken up quite a lot of it, so we will move on. Um, But if you've got questions, if you've got things that you're thinking about on the stuff that I've missed out, feel free to ask me later, uh, or better yet, have a go at looking in your own time. Let curiosity get the better of you. Let it stir something in you that yearns to know more of God. So we'll move on to verses 27 to 31. Now this is where Paul goes into defence mode. He defends this gospel of grace through faith against three questions. Now it's possible that Paul has faced someone asking these questions when he's shared the gospel in, in synagogues. Or perhaps he asked these three questions himself when he first came to faith in Christ. Either way, he now presents these questions to the church in Rome uh, as if being asked by an imagined heckler. Oi, Paul, I've lived a great life according to the law. Don't I deserve salvation? Shouldn't I be rewarded for my good service? To which Paul responds, boasting is excluded. It's out of the question. But why? Because works of any kind cannot save you. Only justification by faith in Christ. As we saw earlier, faith is only worth something because of the person in whom we put our faith. Because of Christ. You can't work for your salvation. It doesn't work like that. But do you ever find yourself trying to? Do you ever find yourself thinking that you deserve salvation? Or that maybe you have to do things at church or do good things for other people, live a Christ-like life to earn or deserve a better person. Now Paul says earlier in Romans that no, you can't do it. You don't deserve it. You'll never deserve it. There's something wrong with us at a heart level. We can't work for our salvation. And we don't have to because God in Christ has already won the decisive victory he has done all that is necessary and this is one of the things that sets the Christian faith apart from any other faith system that you can find worldwide Hinduism says do this and this and this and you might be counted as righteous now go and do Islam says, do this and this and this, and you might be counted as righteous. Now go and do. Buddhism says, do this and this and this, and you might reach nirvana. Now go and do. The Gospel according to the Jehovah's Witnesses says, here's Jesus, but also do this. Convert this many people, knock on this many doors, and you might make it into the 144,000. Now go, 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 go! Jesus says, I did this, and this, and this, for you, because you couldn't. Trust me, put your faith in me, and you will be counted as righteous. Now come, it's done. It is done finished then the heckler pipes up again but what's all this about the gentiles we jews are the chosen people of god how come they get in on our salvation jews had great pride in their national and spiritual identity as the chosen people of god many times the pharisees would say to jesus ah but but abraham is our father The problem is that they had forgotten what God had promised Abraham when he said he would make him into a great nation. Genesis 12 verses 2 and 3 says, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and those who curse you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Right from the outset, The people of Israel were to be the vehicle 
by which God would bless all people. Now, I know I sometimes forget that I've been blessed by God to be a blessing. How about you? Have you shared the blessing of hope and peace through the saving grace of Christ with someone you know recently? Maybe someone you don't know? This world is desperate for hope. It is desperate for hope. In the face of everything that's happened in the last 18 months, the thing that I have seen time and time again is people are hungry for hope. We know hope. We have met hope. The source of hope and peace dwells within us by the Holy Spirit. Are we sharing that with the people we meet? Paul responds to the heckler and says, Yes, God is the God of the Jews, but if he is the one true God, he is the one true God for all people. Truth can't be true for one person and not another. If something is true, it's true for everyone. If God is the one true God, he is the one true God. One. He can't be, oh, he's the one true God for you. But my truth is different. If truth is truth, it's objective, it's solid. You can't cut it and slice it and do anything else with it. If God is the one true God, he is the one true God for all. And the third time, the heckler pipes up, and this time, I like to imagine that he's getting a little bit more irate. He's trying to trip Paul off on something. All right, Paul, answer me this if you're so clever. If this salvation is all about grace through faith, where does the law fit in? Do we do away with it because, because of the law that requires faith? Can we do away with the law because we've got faith? To which Paul responds, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. As Paul mentions earlier in Romans, the law is good and holy, but it serves to point out our sin. Romans 3 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law points out what is already wrong. It points out our need of a saviour. Now, our faith in Christ Jesus is a fulfilment of that same law. And that's not to say that we Throw the law out the window. Jesus has already fulfilled the law, so I can do what I want. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do as I say. And Paul writes this later on in Romans as he begins to explain to the Roman church how they should respond to the gospel. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, you probably know it very well. Therefore, I urge you, brothers... In view of God's mercy, in view of all of this that we've spent looking at this morning, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. And when it says this is your spiritual act of worship, it also could be translated as this is your reasonable act of worship. This is the next logical step. Once we've grasped the gospel, once we've understood our justification by faith, the next logical step, the only possible step we can take 
is to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice, to live our lives wholly for Christ. We can't earn our salvation. Salvation has been won for us by the blood of Christ. Our response must be to lay down our lives as a living sacrifice to him. But now, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are freely justified by his grace. Freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is, not, is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the, the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Let's pray together. Father, we cannot do anything but stand in awe of the cross of Christ. That we, by being washed in his blood, would be not only welcomed into the courts of the king, but adopted as sons and daughters. We ask this morning that by your Holy Spirit that dwells in us because of Christ, you would make this truth real to us. That as we chew this truth over today, this week, these next months, that we would really begin to understand what it means to be justified by faith. And would you show us what it means to lay down our lives as a living sacrifice day after day to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. We're going to sing a hymn together, Crown Him with Many Crowns.
I love that hymn. I've always loved that one. We've done a lot this morning. If God has spoken to you in a particular way this morning, talk to someone. One of the incredible things about being saved by God is that we're not just saved from sin, but we're saved to Christ. And we're saved to Christ together. We walk this walk together. So if you need prayer this morning, I would be glad to pray with you. If you want to pray with someone you know, look around you. This is your family in Christ. Don't go away today without praying with someone. with us and you're not seated in the building or even if you are and you still want to get in touch with us during the week then please visit our website www.cppc.co.uk if you want to send us an email or a message you can do that on the website at the bottom of the home page there is a messaging function or if you want to email just use the email address connect at cppc.co.uk and now let's bless and encourage one another by saying the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thanks for being here this morning, folks. Hope you have a great week. See you all again soon.